Good morning. It's another beautiful day in the Pacific Northwest, and you're here worshiping together with us. Thank you so much for being here and being online with us. Hey, before I go any farther, I just, I just want to remind you, we're, we are going to be receiving communion. And if there's one thing that stretched, stretched me in the last few months, it's, it's this. <laughs> It's this, this simple little container. So, so we don't have to talk about it later. There's a little f- layer of film on the top. It's got a little bit of a design on it. That's the part that when we get ready to receive communion, you'll pull that off first. That'll get you to the little wafer. And then the, the, the bigger tab is to get you to the juice. Now, so far, I haven't seen any spraying going on of juice. Like somebody opens it like a bag of chips and it goes everywhere. But I just want to make sure you know how to navigate this. It's been challenging for me. I'm sure I'm not the only one, though I may be the only one to admit it. But anyway, that'll be for later, okay? And just a couple other things. One, if you notice a sign coming in, uh, there's a sign there that says uh, we're collecting for uh, Grace Loves Auburn. Now, this is our event. We've actually set it up to be in, in August, the end of August this year. This is an event where we just give away as much as we can to the community that comes in. Baby clothes, adult clothes, houseware items. I mean, there is a list of things. And so what we're doing is the first weekend of every month, you can bring your donations and take them out to the container that's outside there. And there'll be somebody there to, to receive that from you. It'll go right into the container and we'll secure it there. Uh, it is kind Kind of the bookend. We've got that at the end of the summer, which is a big evangelistic event. And then at the beginning of summer, we got this thing called the main event, which you've already heard about. We are so excited about that to be able to just plan for that, trusting that God's got a plan and that we'll have so many kids here from the community that haven't heard about Jesus, families that'll be bringing their kids, and it's just going to be a wonderful time. So that's at the beginning of summer, Grace of Zobrin at the end of summer, and in the middle, there's going to be a great series on serving. I think you're really going to enjoy it, and God will inspire you through that. And so just glad to have so much happening coming up this summer. Now, Pastor Jesse is gone uh, this weekend. Uh, Every once in a while, he takes a break and there's usually a really, really good reason. And frankly, this is probably the best. Uh, He's celebrating his wedding anniversary with his wife, Lori. They took the weekend off and yeah, exactly. So they uh, deserve a break. If you're watching, happy anniversary. We're just uh, glad that we can uh, support him and he can enjoy a weekend away with Lori. My name is Mark Edwards. I'm the camp and Next Gen Pastor, and it's a privilege uh, to share with you today. Uh, we're on this series, What is God Saying? And talking about and using the books of the Minor Prophets, which are, uh, let's just be, let's just, just put it out there. Let's get it out of the way. We don't spend a lot of time in the Minor Prophets. I get it. We've got a great devotional book you can take notes in. Those are available in the lobby. You can get it online. But this is a series that, uh, frankly, I'm grateful for. At the same time, I am challenged with, uh, especially today. I, Zephaniah, we're going to be in Zephaniah. Now, when you're on your smart device, it's easy to find. When you're in your actual Bible, it can be a challenge finding those three or four little pages for Zephaniah. But that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in chapter, chapter one today. Before we go any farther, too, as you're looking up, I want to introduce somebody to you. Uh, their picture is going to be on the screen. This is Joel Hess and his wife, Jackie, and Gabriel and Nora. Uh, we are excited to have uh, Joel on staff with us. He is our facilities director. Uh, he brings not only ministry background in student ministry, many years of that, but also many years in construction and maintenance. And uh, you may not see him all that often. He's not necessarily going to be here at every weekend service. But I'm telling you, we found God brought the right person that loves loves the Lord, has a serious commitment to this building, and so it's glad that we're glad to have him with us. Okay, Zephaniah chapter 1. Before we read all of chapter 1, we're going to read it all because it's the only chapter for the day. This is the topic for today. Uh, I just want to share something that just struck me about as I was preparing. You know, growing up as a kid uh, in the in the 70s, one of the biggest kind of type of movie that came out were these disaster movies. Now, some of you may never have seen them. It's okay. I'm a little bit older, but those of you who are my age or older or just into that type of movie, you would have seen these. And these would be movies like um, Airport and then all the f- years of the 70s of Airport they made after that. Uh, movies like The China Syndrome, Earthquake, The Towering Inferno. <laughs> Now, in case you, you know, I looked it up just to see if these were moneymaker movies, because you think, oh, those were really big hits. Well, they had all the big stars of the day, and they made a whole lot of money. Now, that's not the point, but the reality was is people were looking to watch disaster movies. Don't know why. As a kid, my parents loved watching them. We would go to the theater. We would go to the drive-in. 
For those of you younger, that's where you drive in your car. You park and you put the speaker on the window. It's quite an experience. They're hard to find now, drive-in theaters, but they were kind of fun. Plus, when I got really freaked out over what I was watching on this humongous screen, I would just drop my head down behind the seat and it was good. Uh, or we'd watch them on TV after they came out, you know, a couple, three years later. Disaster movies. Uh, they, they had a certain premise that just kind of followed along. And the way it worked was the first 20 to 45 minutes, somewhere in there, or actually 20 to 30, the movie would be all about somebody discovered something coming. Whether it was a tsunami, you know, a tidal wave with the Poseidon adventure, or if it was, uh, you know, a faulty uh, construction with the towering inferno. Like, I remember all these things. Like, I just remember these movies. Uh, there was always something that they would discover, and then they weren't sure if they were actually going to tell anybody about it, because there was always some kind of detrimental, you know, ripple from, oh, we can't open that building, or we can't change course, or we can't land early, or whatever. You know, it was always, so we're over the water. Where are we going to land? You know, it was just this huge disaster coming. But the thing I really enjoyed about these movies was towards the end, although a lot of people lost their lives, let's just be real, at the end there was, there was this wonderful conclusion of we saved the plane, we saved most of the passengers, or we protected the world from, or the West Coast from California floating off into the ocean, or whatever it was, whatever it was, there was a good ending. There was, there was some, some understanding and some discovery of someone's courage and determination. And, and so um, I just want to, I share all that with you to say Zephaniah is, we're only going to touch on the first, it's like the first 20 to 30 minutes of a disaster movie. We're not going to get to the good part. The good part, I think, you know, I think he worked it out this way, maybe, but you know, Jeff, Pastor Jesse is going to have the chapters two and three. But for me, we're going to be on the disaster part. Does that sound good? All right. And somehow, some way, God's going to bring something out of that for you and me today. Hmm. I'm not sure how last night went, but maybe today will be better. I don't know. We'll see. But before we read Zephaniah chapter 1, we're going to pray. Father, today is uh, your day another day that we get a chance to come together and worship you. Whether we're in this room or watching online, on social media, whatever it is. God, we, uh, we made a conscious choice to be together today. So there is a plan. You've led us here for such a time as this, for something for us to walk out of here with a changed life, a drawing of being closer to you, something that draws us in tighter into a relationship with you, Lord. Whatever it may be, Father, we, we, just, we choose that today. We look forward to what you're going to do and say through the power of your Holy Spirit into our lives. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yep, that was me hitting my mic. Sorry about that. All right. Zephaniah chapter 1. Now, I'm going to read from the message. And the reason I read from the message occasionally is because it's just easier for me to understand. I'm just going to be real. It's just easier. The language is easier sometimes. And when I'm digging into the Old Testament, I'm thankful for Eugene Peterson. You may not agree with him all the time or may think that the, the way he interprets Scripture is a little bit different, but I appreciate the uh, tangibility, the application of it. So it's going to be right up here behind me on the screen. You can follow along in your translation, or I've even encouraged people to just close their eyes and listen. I'll do my best to, uh, to read it. All right, Zephaniah chapter one. Here we go. Buckle up. God's message to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. It came, I might have pronounced those wrong, forgive me. You can correct me later. It came during the reign of Josiah. Remember the king, King Josiah, the boy king, son of Ammon, who was king of Judah. <clears throat> I'm going to make a clean sweep of the earth, a thorough house cleaning, God's decree. Men and women, animals, including birds and fish, anything and everything that causes sin will go, but especially people. I'll start with Judah and everybody who lives in Jerusalem. I'll sweep the place clean of every trace of the sex and religion ball shrines and their priests. I'll get rid of the people who sneak up to their rooftops at night to worship the star gods and goddesses. Also those who continue to worship God but cover their bases by worshiping other king gods as well. Not to mention those who've dumped God altogether, no longer giving him a thought or offering a prayer. Quiet now, 
Reverent silence before me. God the master. Time's up. My judgment day is near. The holy day is all set. The invited guests made holy. On the holy day, God's judgment day, I will punish the leaders and the royal sons. I will punish those who dress up like foreign priests and priestesses who introduce pagan prayers and practices, and I'll punish all who import pagan superstitions that turn holy places into hell holes. Judgment Day, Dodge, God's decree, cries of panic from the city's fish gate, cries of terror from the city's second quarter, sounds of great crashing from the hills. Wail, you shopkeepers on Market Street, money making has had its day, the God money is dead. On Judgment Day, I'll search through every closet and alley in Jerusalem. I'll find and punish those who are sitting it out, fat and lazy, amusing themselves and taking it easy, who think God doesn't do anything, good or bad. He isn't involved, so neither are we. But just wait. They'll lose everything they have, money and house and land. They'll build a house and never move in. They'll plant vineyards and never taste the wine. A day of darkness at noon. The great judgment day of God is almost here. It's countdown time. Seven, six, five, four. Bitter and noisy cries on my judgment day. Even strong men screaming for help. Judgment day is payday. My anger paid out. A day of distress and anguish, a day of catastrophic doom, a day of darkness at noon, a day of black storm clouds, a day of blood curdling war cries as forts are assaulted, as defenses are smashed. I'll make things so bad they won't know what hit them. They'll walk around groping like the blind. They've sinned against God. Their blood will be poured out like old dishwater and their guts shoveled into slop buckets. Don't plan on buying your way out. Your money is worthless for this. This is the day of God's judgment, my wrath. I care about sin with fiery passion, a fire to burn up the corrupted world, a wildfire finish to the corrupt, corrupting people. Whew. Disaster and judgment is on its way. It's on its way, and we can't even move for, farther to the good stuff. That just sets the tone of these three simple chapters. This first one, so much like a disaster movie in the first 20, 25 minutes. It's like, it's coming. The nuclear reactor is about to melt down. Should we tell anybody? Now, God, in God's way, is very much a gentleman, I say at times, because he lets people know ahead of time. He lets you and I know, as he did back then, that something's about to happen. This was in about approximately 630 B.C. Now, this was in a time frame when this wasn't new news to the Jews. This, was, this had happened generation after generation. I mean, from Nahum, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk, and, that was later, and now Zephaniah... God was going to communicate the destruction of his people. And it wasn't just going to be, hey, you know, I mean, try to picture it. I mean, that's a very intense passage, especially in the, in the message. But this destruction was obliteration. It was obliteration. It was from the Babylonians or other countries that would come in and take over. And when they came, they didn't come and say, hey, can you just kind of move out? We're just going to take over. No, they came in and just annihilated. That was God's plan. They came in and annihilated Jerusalem. Like they leveled it. They leveled it. And all the hillsides in Israel that you look and they're kind of barren. A lot of those weren't barren at the time, 3,000 years ago. They were lush. But they would come in and they would destroy everything. Now, I spent a little bit of time in Israel and I was in Jerusalem. I was up at the, at the Wailing Wall. And there, uh, if you, when, I, when I, I can picture it, when I looked at the wall to my left, there was back, there was this library. It almost looked like it was in a cave, but this library of just old books. And there were a lot of people in there reading and, and uh, worshiping. And, and over on one spot, there is this, this hole in the ground, this square hole. It's about, I don't know, it's about probably three, four feet square. And it's just plexiglass. And I happened to walk over there and, and it's kind of lit up and I'm, I'm like, looking down. <laughs> I'm like, that's a, that's, that's a deep hole. I mean, it was, I don't know, it was 100 feet, 200 feet. It was a long way down. And they had it lit all the way down as far as you could see. 
And the reason that was there was to remind the people that actually there was a sign that said at the bottom of this hole is the original ground level of Jerusalem. Because when people came in and destroyed it, when countries came in and armies came in and they did, just demolished everything, it just turned into rubble. And then they would build it back up. And then it would get demolished again and built back up. And they would, you know, use a lot of the material that was there and, and new material. But it was just that reality of how much they'd gone through. How much Jerusalem had experienced from time and time again, from decade to decade. And, and the, 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 the trend was, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to, be, you're going to run into exile for protection. And then later on, you'll be called back. And God is saying it's about to happen again. It's about to happen again. Now, if you were to take the Old Testament like First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, now, if you do it the way I did it, I just Googled it. I put in chronological order of the Old Testament. It's very helpful. <laughs> you're, you're reading stuff like, did, did I read this before? Yep, you did. It's the same. It's just written differently. It's, put it in order. Put it in order, right? And um, that was the, just the trend. That was the way it happened. People, Jerusalem, the Jews, God's chosen people just kept messing up. Does that sound familiar? Just kept messing up. And God punished them. Why? Because he loved them. That doesn't maybe make sense on the front end, but it's his fiery passion. And they messed up. What did they do? Well, the scripture tells us, but in, in summary, what they did was they put something above God. Not only did they intellectually and emotionally put something above God, they literally created things and put them above God. They disobeyed. They broke the first of Ten Commandments, the very first one, the one that, you know, the first thing you say is generally, generally pretty important, right? God laid it out for them, and they kept messing it up. The first commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. God tells him this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This was at the core of why once again, God through his prophets were saying, judgment day is coming. It is coming. And when you look through and think about this passage, this was no different. I mean, to try to give you an idea, just briefly, an idea of what people were doing at the time in Jerusalem and Israel. They, they weren't just like saying, yeah, you know, I'm not going to go to the temple this week. It wasn't that simple. They were intentionally building, constructing idols and worshiping other gods. I mean, the Baal and um, uh, Asherah, these two male and female gods of the Canaanites, I mean, these were the two primary gods, the god of power and, and the god of fertility. And, and the, what they believe, people believe, is that out of those two gods came a whole bunch of other gods. Hmm. Well, that's pretty exciting. But not only did they build these idols and worship them, these gods, but they also included them. They just kind of morphed them in. They just kind of brought them in alongside Yahweh. They brought them in. So not only were they worshiping God in the temple, they were worshiping other gods in the temple. Now, can you picture that today? I mean, do you think God would be upset? I think so. I think he'd be pretty upset. Like, what are you doing? Did you forget what I've done for you? Again and again? But that's what they were doing. I mean, they, and they, they were also just going up to the rooftops, like in that area. I mean, the roofs were flat. So they climb up on the roofs and they were worshiping the stars. They were worshiping the sun. They were worshiping the earth. They were worshiping everything except the one who deserved the worship above all else. And so God said, it's time. It's time again to punish you for your disobedience, for your pride, for your sin. And you know, there's a whole other message here, but one of a couple of the kings of Judah figured it out. He just happened to be a kid. There's a message there. 
we're not going to go there. But King Josiah, he's like, well, that just makes sense. There shouldn't be anything else here. We should be getting rid of it. He's, and he's here. Can you imagine this? I don't know. Was he 10? Eight. eight thank you. There's a little eight-year-old. I got a granddaughter that's that age. I mean, there's this little kid going, and you need to get rid of that. And that, you need to bring this back. This just doesn't look right. That stuff's got to go. Can you picture that? I can. It makes me smile. That'd be awesome. Uh, can you imagine a kid coming into church and going, uh, okay, I'm in charge. And this is going to go. We got, we're going to have popcorn at every service. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Where's the Twizzlers? Right? I mean, can you imagine the changes? It'd be awesome. That's kind of why we're redecorating downstairs. We think it's kind of important that kids are familiar with the environment and they love it and they're having fun in it. <sighs> Went off track there. We're coming back, coming back. <clears throat> so they were working on it. There was a couple kings that were trying to fix it, but there was a whole lot more that were just ruining it. They were ruining it. It's what I would call a, a drifting time and time again, a slow erosion of leadership. Little changes over time. Now, a little change over time can make a big difference or it can make a big difference in the wrong way. Slow erosion. That's what was going on. That's the picture. OK, and then you're like, where are we going to get application out of this? This is mm, mm. well, here's where I went with this. <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, if I knew there was a change coming or something was happening to me, I think I'd straighten up. I think I'd try to figure out what's most important. I think I'd reprioritize and prioritize my life around the things that matter, the values that I would think matter most, that would be the priority. So that's what we're going to talk about. There's a spot you can take notes. There's going to be a few questions, I think, that we can ask ourselves that help us realign. Because, you know, the, the truth is, Jesus is coming back. Amen. Regardless of whether this scripture was talking about the judgment of Israel then or the judgment of the earth the world now coming up, Jesus is returning. And I'm so excited. How about you? The day is coming and it could come like that, right? It could come like that. It will come like that. We're not going to get a lot of preparation. We've already been told the preparation's already been laid out for us. We just don't know when. So what should we be doing now? Should we just be sitting back going, eh, God is God. He's not good. He's not bad. Eh, I'll put other priorities first. I'll do these things. I'll, I'll focus on these things. You know, I got time. Oh, I'm sorry. I was probably supposed to go there. But the application of this is really important. So we're going to ask a few questions to help us prioritize our lives. I'm just sharing with you how God spoke to me. Here they go. Here we go. You put my glasses back on so I can read my notes. Because you see, if you're, not, if you're not clear on what's important, your life gets a little complicated. If you're not sure what's most important and you're not focused on those things, there's things that happen. Meaning, you can get stressed out. There's a lot of tension. There's confusion in your life. There's those kind of things. If you're not aligned with what's most important and striving to live your life with those priorities, there's tension that comes. There's frustration that comes. And I have realized that time and time again, because the reality is cut into the chase. We've all been where the Jews were at that time. We've all been there. We've all drifted at times. We've all made choices that we go back and go, oh, that really wasn't what was most important. That's the truth of it. So today's kind of just a reset day with Zephaniah chapter one. You probably didn't even think you'd ever, ever hear a message from Zephaniah chapter one, but today you do. So here's a few questions to ask yourself to help you reprioritize. And here's the first one. Who or what is going to be the authority in my life? Who or what is going to be the authority? Now, there's a few options for that. The first option would be, I'm going to be my authority. Me. I will decide. However I feel, however I choose, I'm going to be the authority. Hmm. God speaks about that. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. How you feel. Time and time again, we make decisions. We make decisions. And we make decisions, let's just be real, that are really self-centered. 
it's, uh, it shouldn't be normal. We don't want it to be normal, but we react to things. How many times have you reacted to something or someone, don't look at them if they're sitting beside you, <laughs> or someone and thought, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I had decided different. What, what, what did our parents tell us? Hindsight is 2020. Are we going to be the authority? Are we going to be the, the person that decides what's most important? Or are we going to, the second one would be, we could let the world decide for us. Because the world, you know, they've got it all figured out, right? I mean, we're, we're, we live in a world of, of peace and harmony and love. It's everywhere, right? It's just so you know, we're supposed to be the light and the salt and the love that the world experiences. We're called to do that as Christ followers. If you didn't know that, just know the most important thing is love. The world needs more of it. We're called to love. But the world thinks, well, let's see what the world thinks. First John chapter 2. Here's what God says. First John chapter 2, 15 and 16. Out of the message, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, nothing, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world would tell you, and frankly we spend a lot of money doing this, we, we focus on looking good, feeling good, and acquiring the goods, right? Yes. It's who we are. We, 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 we want that. We desire that. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it's wrong when it becomes the most important thing. The world will tell you those are the things that matter most. It's what you achieve. It's your job. It's your position. That's what the world says. But I would say the third option of where your authority should come from is this one, and that's from God and His Word. Jesus said, John chapter 8, Jesus said to the people who believed in Him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Is God your authority? Is Scripture the foundation of your life? Like, when you have a decision to make, or you're in a situation, where do you turn to? Do you look in the mirror and go, what am I supposed to do? Do you think about, well, what's the values around me? Or do you stop and go, well, you know what? Maybe I should wait upon the Lord. Maybe I should listen to what He's saying to me. Maybe I should be in Scripture and, and focus on that. Just an idea. It would be the right one to go with out of the three, just so you know. This is a multiple ch choice where C is the right answer. Seeking the Lord. Seeking the Lord. He's the authority. That's the first question. The next question would be this. When you're reprioritizing, when you're choosing what matters, will I choose now or later? Now or later? 1 John 2, verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now or later? See, sometimes we choose now because we're just not too excited about what later represents. We choose now because we think it's the path of least resistance, where it's going to be the least uncomfortable. Sometimes now isn't the right answer. You know, as we follow Jesus and we grow in that relationship with Him and, and we learn how to respond appropriately, there are times, more often than not, because we're not real patient, are we, where later is better than now. It's better. And it's in those trials and in crisis where we realize that uh, maybe if I chose now, I wouldn't be going through this. No, no. You look in Scripture. Uh, there's so many places in Scripture where later is better, even though it's more painful. Look at Job. That, that man, that man went through everything. He struggled. He was in pain, physical, emotional, everything. And he continued to trust God no matter what. No matter what, he knew later was better than now. He could, have, he could have made other decisions. He could have walked away. He could have pushed God away, but he continued to trust God. He continued to trust Moses, Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. 
choosing later over now. Which is better? Will I choose now and the immediate gratification or later? See, later means I got my eyes set on heaven. Later means I know what's to come, that this world is temporary. Later means that there's something better and that this life is preparation. This is the life where God helps us love better, helps us live with him first, helps us keep him first. By the power of his Holy Spirit, we get to, we get to choose later because later is better. Third question, will I choose what's easy or what's best? Easy is easy. Will I choose what's easy or what's best? Psalm 119, 37. Turn my eyes from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. There's the typo. Did they fix it? You did. God bless you. Thank you. We had a typo last night. That was it. Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Jesus said, don't store up tre treasures here on earth where they can erode away or may be stolen. Store them in heaven where they will never lose their value. You know, think about it. Think about it. Parenting. You, you, you could take the easy path with parenting. Just give them what they want. Because they... <laughs> I mean, King Josiah knew what he needed, what needed to be done. But for the most part, we love our kids so much that we are going to help them understand what's most important, right? Right. Yes, right. Grandparenting, that's a different thing. But parents. <laughs> <laughs> I did just say that out loud. <clears throat> what's best is not fun sometimes. I can speak firsthand to how difficult things can be. You, there's so many of you that have shared with me difficult times in your lives. And there would be the easy path and the now path, or there'd be the wait on the Lord and trust the Lord and keep plowing ahead, keeping God close path. Right? But the, the truth of it is, here's what it comes down to. We respond and respond to God for the most part. We make decisions about prioritizing our lives when things get difficult. I can tell you firsthand that when the, I think it was July 7th, I think it was July 7th, but the women's U.S. soccer team was playing in the World Cup finals and my daughter had a seizure and she ended up in the hospital. And that night when I looked at that computer screen in her room with our family there and we looked at that screen and we saw what we saw about what was to come and that that tumor was big, that cancer was big in her brain and there was going to need to be surgery and treatment. In that moment, everything changed, absolutely everything. In crisis, we've got to be so close to Jesus, we turn towards him and go, what really does matter and not run from him like he's punishing us. He's given us heaven, eternity with him beyond what we can imagine with brand new bodies. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. But in that moment, in that moment, everything changed. I remember coming to church the first weekend back from, from um, I, don't, I don't even know if it was the first weekend back, but it was a weekend that was the first weekend my daughter had gone through surgery. She'd gone through treatment, started getting ready to start treatments. She'd had seizures. She was back in the hospital and they got her, we got her home. Her husband got her home. She was look, doing good. Everything was stabilized. She was home. Came in the building. Think, wow. Oh. Jessica's home. We got here and uh, I'm walking the building. I was by myself. I think my wife was home or with Jessica and I'm coming in and I, the phone rings, my phone rings. And I'm like, hello? She goes, it's my wife. I think my wife called me. She said, a Jessica wants everybody over at the house for pizza for dinner. Uh -huh. Right? Now I can tell you, I don't say this with I say this kind of just as a confession more than anything else. Like that was one of the very few times and maybe even the first time in all years of ministry where it was so clear, so clear that I wasn't going to be at church that night. I was standing in that lobby and I get this phone call and, and she's like, Jessica wants everybody over for pizza for dinner. I'm like, okay. I hang up 
and I'm, as I'm hanging up, I'm realizing I'm, I'm not staying. I'm going, right? And, and, but then the enemy's like, you know, kind of making you think, ah, oh, you know. And I could feel that coming on, but I'm like, my life has changed, right? So I, I turn, I'm thinking, I need to go tell Jesse. And I turn, and there he is, standing right in front of me. He goes, what's going on? He go, I go, Jessica, I just got a call. Jessica wants everybody over to her house for dinner. He, he doesn't even hesitate. He looks at me and says, you need to go. Amen. And I'm like, Amen. that's right, God. That was the reinforcement I needed, right? And I didn't think about, oh, I need to go make sure it's going to be okay downstairs or take care of this, take that. Like, I just turned and walked out the building. Why? Because my priorities, my values had been readjusted, had been recalibrated. Everything had changed. And I was going to respond based on what's most important. How will you respond in times of crisis? How will you respond when things come? Because that's when we really do have the opportunity to make those adjustments. Priorities change. We get disciplined. We get pruned. We get challenged. What are you going through right now? What are you dealing with where it's a reminder to you? good or bad, can be the birth of a child. Like there's some really great things that happen to us that we experience, we go, oh, that changes everything. It doesn't always have to be bad. How are you responding in those moments? Because really it comes down to the fourth question when it comes to prioritizing and placing the values in the right place. Much longer today, sorry guys. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? When you make those changes and you prioritize and get your values, but is it worth it? Depends on what you're, where you place your value, right? But is it worth it in the long haul? Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. What profit is there if you gain the world and lose eternal life? What can be compared with the value of eternal life? And this passage out of the New Living Translation, Paul writes in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value. You know, infinite's like forever, right? Infinite, that's forever. I love you, I love you more, I love you for eternity, I love you infinitely. With the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake I have discarded everything else counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Since the beginning of time, the battle continues between right and wrong, easy and difficult, easy and best, now or later. In the garden, they discovered they made a mistake and they ran and hid. And for every century following, there were times when man ran away and hid and went into exile. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm just hiding from God. I'm just, I'm just tired. I am upset. I blame him. Why did he do this? Can I just say, that's not the God we serve. It's not. See, God gave everything. Like he gave everything so that he could be in relationship with us, everything. Cue the, cue the piano. He gave everything. Absolutely everything. He sent his son to demonstrate his love for us. Like, he's not a God that punishes us. He's a guy that tries to correct us. God is a God of correction. He's a God of love, and he's a God of correction. correction. And he wants us to live this life in such a way that more people will come to know him. We're to love, no matter what. What are your values? What are the priorities in your life? What needs to be tweaked this morning? You're going to have a chance to do that, to take a couple minutes and just pause and say, you know what? God, I don't know why I blamed you for this. This was my choice. I'm sorry. I chose. I chose now over best. I chose easy. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. And if you're here, you're watching online and you're like, man, I, I don't have a relationship with God. I didn't know God loved me that much. He does. 
He does. The truth is we live this life on our terms most of the time and it takes a lifetime to get closer and closer to live life on his terms, to trust him no matter what, to put our faith in him, to live for him. And I would say today, this morning, I just want to tell you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, being a Christ follower isn't for wimps. It's not easy, but it's worth it. You see, it wasn't easy for God to send his son. It wasn't. See, he, he had the perfect relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We won't go into that, but it was the perfect community. And he said, I need you to go. Be born a child, grow up, help people understand how much I love them. You do what I'm calling you to do, you do it. In the power that I give you, do it. You're God, you're my son, you go do it. And then, and I'm going to have to watch you die because I love my creation so much that I will sacrifice you to make sure I don't lose everybody else. That's a God of love. Do you think God gets great pleasure in destruction? No. Nope. It breaks his heart. It also breaks his heart when his kids are staying away from him. That breaks his heart more. Would you bow your heads for a minute? Just between you and the Lord. We're going to receive communion in a couple of minutes, but right now, if you're here or you're watching online and you realize there's a change in, in your mind that needs to happen, it's called repentance. There's a change in direction you need to make. It's time to walk towards God and not away from him. It's a time to know Jesus, maybe for the very first time. And if you're here, just pray a simple prayer. Jesus, I, I, I know that it's going to take a lot to figure all this out, but I do know I need you. I don't even know why. I mean, I can just sense it in my heart, in my spirit, that there's something missing and it's actually someone and it's you. And God, I know you love me. You sent your son to die for my sins, my mistakes. And so today I trust you with my life. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. And I accept you into my life as Lord and Savior. It's as simple as that. It's just crying out to God for help and he responds. So if you're here and you're doing that, I just celebrate that with you even now. And if you're here and before we receive communion as a family, maybe it's just adjustment time. Maybe it's just adjustment time. Maybe there's just something that's kind of got out of whack. Something became more important than it should. And God got kind of, kind of bundled in with other stuff and he's not set apart anymore. So take a second and just confess that to him. Say, God, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna step into this week by your power and by your strength to uh, keep things in the right perspective, to keep my values in the right place, to put you first. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, for your love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Okay, you've got this little cup. Or if you're online at home, you've got elements at home, things that represent these two things. And, you know, the Bible tells us that, um, well, first of all, there's a couple things that, that God uh, set up for us to remember. One is um, we get baptized. If you haven't been baptized, baptism is a, uh, an experience, an opportunity to publicly testify of your relationship with Jesus. And we remember that moment. We've experienced it together. And then he gives us and demonstrated us what we're to remember about his crucifixion and what he gave for us. He gave us everything. It's called communion. And so you got this little cup and the Bible tells us that when Jesus was with his disciples, his closest friends, he, uh, we call it the last supper. There was bread and wine at the table and Jesus grabbed the bread and he broke it and he passed it out. And he said, basically, here's how it works. 
This bread represents my body that's going to be broken for you. It's going to be broken for you. And then he took the juice, the wine, and shared it. And he said, this wine represents the new covenant, the new covenant. My blood to be shed for you. And I have a clue. I, I, I'm sure they were kind of clueless because the disciples struggled with things for a while. It's understandable. So do we. But the reality is, is he set a tone for us today to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection, to celebrate all that he gave. So you're going to take that little, little layer off the top. Father, we hold this wafer as a representation, a reminder of what you did for us. Your body broken like you willingly sacrificed for us. And we begin even this moment to remember and to celebrate all that you've done. Let's eat together. And this cup, like we talked about this juice. Father, we hold the, this little cup of juice and we're reminded of all that you gave for us, literally everything. So we pause and we say thank you. Thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace, your forgiveness. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Let's drink together. And now we have the privilege of just singing one more song, one more song to help us focus on Jesus and all that he's done for us. I'm just going to invite you to stand as the band leads us. Let's worship him one more time with this last song, one, a little bit longer. Let's sing together. Yo, subscribe to the YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to this channel. <laughs>